everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. everybody welcome to treatment options for arthritis of the hip and knee with dr stephen rossman just a few quick notes before we start the presentation please keep your microphone muted during the presentation this helps cut down on the background noise um also please hold your questions until the end of your presentation when you do have questions you can use the chat box down below um captions are provided for this event you can press the captions button at the bottom of the screen to view your captions and I will put the link for Spanish captions in the chat box shortly. Um, a few days after the event, everyone who registered is gonna receive an email from the library with evaluation forms from both the library and from our grant sponsor. Um, please consider filling out these evaluations because they really help us in providing future programming and improving our programming. So we would really appreciate if you fill those evaluations out. So on behalf of our library director, Sai Rao and the entire library staff, um, I'd like to start by thanking Hackensack Meridian Health, Cal State's Medical Center, Ms. Nikki Medeiros, and Dr. Stephen Rossman for generously donating their time to organize and appear at this event. We greatly appreciate you being here. Um, I would also uh, like to thank the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Middle Atlantic Region, a partner of the All of Us Research Program, for providing a grant funding tonight's captions. So the All of Us Research Program aims to build one of the largest, most diverse collection of data of its kind for health research. The goal is to have 1 million or more diverse volunteers nationwide who will sign up to share information over time. The goal of the program is to help researchers understand more about why people get sick or stay healthy. By looking for patterns, researchers may learn more about what affects people's health. To learn more about the All of Us Research Program, visit www.joinallofus.org. Dr. Steve Rossman is a fellowship trained board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in adult reconstructive orthopedic surgery of the hip and knee. He maintains a strong focus on patient education as part of his approach and exploring non-operative treatment is of the utmost importance to him. If surgery is necessary, Dr. Rossman performs partial and total joint replacements of the hip and knee. In addition to primary joint replacements, Dr. Rossman has extensive expertise in performing revision joint replacement surgery for cases such as infection, fracture, implant loosening, or instability. He takes a multidisciplinary approach in these cases in order to achieve the best possible outcomes for his patients. Conditions that he cares for include osteoarthritis, partial and total joint replacement of the knee and hip, revision joint replacement, fractures of the entire lower extremity, excluding the foot, hip and knee joint pain, joint infection, and instability. Um, Nikki, did you want to say a couple words? I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for being here this evening. Uh, Hackensack Meridian Health Palisades Medical Center uh, is honored to have North Bergen Library as our collaborating partner for many years. Uh, it's these types of informative and educational programs uh, that are essential for our well-being and our development. Uh, so again, thank you all so much. Uh, you're going to enjoy the evening. Uh, he's one of my best speakers. Um, and I hand it over to Dr. Stephen Rossman. All right, thank you very much, Chelsea and Nikki, for that uh, nice introduction. Give me a second here while I uh, do my share screen. I have a little bit more facial hair than I did in that picture. This is the COVID beard that we're growing out as most people are. Okay, let's see, Microsoft PowerPoint. Share. Yes. All right, can I get a thumbs up from people if they can see my, my single slide? Yes. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, thank, you, thank you everybody for being here. Um, my name is Steve Rossman. This, this uh, talk is titled um, Treatment Options for Arthritis of the Hip and Knee. Uh, extremely large topic. I'm going to do my best to, to go over everything from non-operative to operative treatments of arthritis um, within about an hour. 
Um, and of course, you know, when we normally do these in person, it's extremely informal raising your hands in the middle of it, but secondary to the Zoom format. If, you, if, you, if, you, if any guys or gals have questions, write something in the comments and I'll, I'll stay as long as it takes to get through all of them and answer everything that we may have. All right, so disclosures, I have none. This is me and my partner, Dr. Sid Mehta. This is outside of uh, Palisades Medical Center um, with, a, with a beautiful view of the city. So just a little bit of our, our agenda tonight. Um, we're gonna go over what is arthritis, who gets arthritis, some of the clinical symptoms of arthritis. We're gonna discuss conservative treatments, surgical options, and of course, any questions that anybody has. So just a little bit about myself. I grew up in New City, Rockham County, New York. Did my undergraduate at SUNY Binghamton in upstate New York, medical school out in Long Island at the New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. So I was in New York my whole life, and then I got into residency in South Jersey, um, where I did a five-year orthopedic surgery residency. Um, and then if, if there was any place I ever thought I would be, it would be out in the Midwest, where I, where I did my fellowship in hip and knee replacement out in University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Um, Can everybody hear me again? Good. Okay. Um, where we did where we, we did a, um, a, a primary hip and knee revisions, complex revisions. Um, my first job out of fellowship for the pet for three years was as chief of uh, chief of adult reconstructive surgery at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School in Newark, and then Hackensack recruited me and stole me away from them um, in July of 2019. So <clears throat> it's been a little bit over a year and a half. Um, I work both at both at the Hackensack main campus and then the Hackensack Palisades Medical Center. A uh, little bit of view. This is just this is just our beautiful view from our office building at Palisades Medical Center, overlooking overlooking the Hudson in Manhattan. And ne never get tired of this. Um, a little bit about the rest of the people, some of the other people in my group. It's not just me. There's a group of us. Dr. Ke Michael Kelly is is the chairman of orthopedics for all of Hackensack Meridian. Um, Dr. Kissin uh, is um, robotic knee replacement. He does he does sports injuries and also total joints about the knee. Fran Patterson and Baldus Lelkis are two, two orthopedic oncology um, surgeons. Um, Sid Mehta is uh, a shoulder and elbow specialist, and then Amit Merchant is a pediatric orthopedics, and we're ever growing. Uh, so on to the on to the show. A little bit about what is arthritis. So um, the CDC, in addition to Fauci talking about everything with COVID, they talk about some other things as well. So uh, arthritis is basically inflammation or swelling of one or more of the joints, and over a hundred separate conditions can can be arthritis. Now, certainly, what we're going to talk about today is mainly osteoarthritis, but of course, arthritis can be caused by autoimmune types of diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. It can be caused by crystal disease such as gout or pseudogout. It can be infectious. Uh, and this is just to name a few, obviously. Uh, but the main thing we're going to focus on is osteoarthritis. So, so what is osteoarthritis? Osteoarthritis is a mechanical issue, and it's a breakdown of the articular cartilage. And the analogy I like to use is like treads on a tire, okay? When we're all, when we're all young and born, we have nice new tires, and just like, just like tires, when they get 50,000 miles on them, they start, they start getting bald, and, and the treads wear down. That's kind of the basic way to think about cartilage in your knee or your hip or any, or any joint for that matter. Uh, but basically, the, the, cartilage, the cartilage cells release inflammation, starts a chemical reaction, and the bottom line is, is the cartilage gets worn down over time. Now, multiple joints can certainly be affected, but the most common joints are, are the hip, knee, and hands. Uh, but it really, it can be any joint in the body. <clears throat> and these are just some pictures. There's going to be lots of pictures, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my pointer here so you guys can see. And these are just normal and abnormal pictures. So the picture here on the left is just a normal picture of the hip. The ball, it's a ball and socket joint. And, um, and then right next to it is, um, is cartilage, where the cartilage is worn down and develops arthritis. And again, more pictures, and then all the way on the right, you can see the, the concomitant versions of the, of the um, x-ray for those pictures of what happens with a normal hip joint. And, I, and this is what I go through all my patients. The hip is like a ball and socket joint. So there's your ball, and, there, and your socket is right here. And this little black curve that's in between it, that's your cartilage. We can't see cartilage on x-rays, but that space is where cartilage is. 
So on the picture in the bottom right, you can see that it's pretty much bone on bone. There is no cartilage space. That's why we call it bone on bone. And same thing in the knee, okay? You know, this is a view, this is a view of the knee where the cartilage is getting worn down, okay? Now, what are the risk factors for osteoarthritis? There's, they are extremely numerous. Uh, advancing age, people who um, are higher weight or BMI more, causes more stress on the joints. Females tend to have some higher, higher incidence of arthritis in the knees and the hand. There can certainly be a genetic component. You know, if your mom or dad had arthritis or other people in the family, that can certainly happen, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna have, that it's gonna happen to you. Anatomy, this, this is actually a picture of, of, of a congenital cause, meaning this patient was born with, with a shallow cup. Their acetabulum wasn't born, they weren't properly um, formed. And so the hips, this is called dysplasia basically. And this is a full gamut of spectrum of disease, but this is just a picture of that. Certainly you can have arthritis is from trauma, uh, an old ACL injury. If the ACL is not fixed, uh, it, causes, it causes improper mechanics across the knee and that can lead it. And local repetitive use. And these are just a few. And many times we don't even know what cause, we don't even necessarily have a reason, but, but it, it happens. Who gets osteoarthritis? Well, greater than 27 million adults greater than the age of 25. It is the leading cause of disability in the United States. You can see the numbers, you know, almost up to 15, 20% of people over 50 will have osteoarthritis in the knee. For adults 60 years or older, typically women have higher, higher prevalence, and this is only like, likely to increase. What are some of the clinical symptoms of arthritis? Well, um, let's talk a little bit about pain. Um, usually it's a deep ache, throbbing. Early on in the disease, uh, it may, the pain only may, may be activity related. Um, but when the disease progresses further, it's not only activity related, it may be at rest. Or a lot of times people say at night, maybe worse first thing in the morning. And as you, as you get that joint moving, it improves throughout the day. And I always like to think of the joints as like motor oil, um, in, in, motor oil inside the joints. And when it's cold outside, that motor oil is not going to move as much. And especially when your joints are cold, um, usually makes it worse. A lot of people who have arthritis, kind of say, I know when it's going to rain better than the weatherman does. So um, that's not an uncommon thing. Certainly difficult with stairs, putting on shoes and socks, as, as you saw from the previous x-rays and the other x-rays I'm going to show you. It's a mechanical thing. The, the, the joint may physically not move in those types of um, positions. You can get swelling after activity. Again, you can get stiffness if sitting for a long period of time. You may have cracking or popping in the knee or the hip. Uh, there can be some instability difficulty walking, decreased range of motion. All these things are just basic things that can happen. Um, and certainly if you have any of these things, this might be, you know, if, if, it, if it doesn't go away after a day or two, that might be a time when you want to go to your doctor and get it checked out. So again, just a lot of, I love pictures. So if you look at the picture on the left here, this is a normal hip. It's a ball and socket. There's your ball in the center and there's your socket. And then this black curve right in between, that's your cartilage. This is a very nice joint space. This person has no arthritis. If we move to the center picture, now we start getting some mild arthritis where this joint space is just becoming a little bit, a little bit narrower. The, the, the white around the acetabulum, this curve, you're starting to get some sclerotic bone that's forming. This is all part of arthritis. And again, as we move all the way to the right, you get pretty much the four tenets of arthritis where you get joint space narrowing, you get, you get some cysts that form, you get the bone spurs or osteophytes as they're called, and, um, and the sclerosis, which is basically the white that I can see on an x-ray. And the bone actually becomes hard. Again, normal x-ray, both hips compared to this, bone on bone arthritis of both of the hips. And on the knee side, it's the same exact thing. Now here we go, if we, if we look over here, and this is actually the inside of the knee. This is the left, the left picture is a knee without any arthritis. The center looks like the inner part of the knee is starting to develop more arthritis, and then you can see bone on bone, so just the seat full thing. And here we go again, more pictures. This is a normal view of some of the x-rays that I'll get, uh, that most people will get of the knee. This, this center picture with the patella, that's called the sunrise view, as, as the, that's literally the kneecap that you're seeing. Um, like the sunrise over the horizon, so that's why it's called that. And we can see the joint space. Some more pictures. On the picture on the left, this person has arthritis just on the inside of the knee. 
On the top central picture, this person has severe arthritis underneath the kneecap. And then in the pictures on the bottom and the right, on the right-hand side of the screen, this person has arthritis in all the compartments of the knee. So it can be, it can be in one compartment or all over the knee. So what can we do about it? So my, my, my way in which that I approach managing patients is always least invasive to most invasive. Though, though I'm a surgeon and I love performing surgery, surgery is always the last option, absolutely the last option. The beautiful thing about arthritis compared to some other conditions or diseases out there is arthritis is not a life-threatening illness. It's just painful and it makes it difficult to move and walk around. So it, nobody's gonna die from arthritis, so it, we can do everything we possibly can. When all of that fails, that's when we consider joint replacement. So let's move along with least invasive. Um, activity modification is, is on the top of the list. Just by walking, you can create four to six times your body weight across your joints, your hips and your knees. So a lot of weight is placed just from, just from walking. So low imp so if we're running could be something like running could be ex even more than that. So we generally recommend low impact exercises, swimming, treadmill, going on the bike, going on the elliptical. Maybe you know walking is okay, but even lower impact exercises would be even better, especially if you had arthritis. Diet and weight loss. This is huge. Um, so um, certainly recommending losing weight because less weight on your body is less weight on your joints. Um, and there's obviously many, many diets out there, many fads out there, but that is something that's always recommended um, for pain control. Glucosamine and chondroitin. This is a question that I get almost every single day. And, and one of the things to know is there's, certainly there's a lot of money on all aspects from healthcare to, to pills and everything like that. And, none of, and, and everything that you see out there on glucosamine and chondroitin, there is no FDA regulation. So Walgreens can put whatever they want on there. And from the orthopedic studies that have been done is there's no, ev there's no evidence to prove that it's necessary or helps. Everything is in animal studies. And so when patients ask me, should I go out and get it? Oh, well, some patients swear by it, so go ahead, get it. But again, I wouldn't tell people to waste their money on it because there's been, no, there's been nothing that's shown that it's good. What has been shown that it's good? So NSAIDs are what's known as anti-inflammatories. This is your Advil, your Motrin, your Aleve. Some of the, some of the longer acting things like Celebrex or, or Meloxicam or Mobix. These are some of the, the Mobix usually one of my go-tos because it's a once a day dosage and people take enough pills. Tylenol can be helpful, but not as much as the anti-inflammatories. And again, the reason why the anti-inflammatories work is because this is an inflammatory condition, and if we can decrease inflammation, we can help decrease the pain. And, and obviously, you could, you could do an entire talk just on narcotics because this is, a, this is a, an epidemic in this country, but um, there is no role for them because they don't treat inflammation. All they do is mask the pain. They're habit-forming, and um, patients, I do not prescribe narcotics for patients. Keeping on moving along, there's you know, different types of braces that can help with stability and balance. It can help offload the joint forces. Just having something wrapped around the knee can be very helpful because it can help increase the temperature around the knee and people can find them very helpful. Um, using a cane, a walker uh, can exp really help offload the forces in the joints. Physical therapy is extremely important. Almost all of us are weak in some way, shape, or form. And just by strengthening the lower extremities around the hip or the knee can, can significantly help with, um, with our pain. Um, exercise program and balances and balance also helps as well. All right, so now the next level after we do the conservative kind of non-invasive treatment is the injections. Um, and there's two main types of injections, the corticosteroid injection or the steroid injection. Um, is, is usually the first line of what we do. It it's a, it's, could be a combination of multiple types of medicines, but in general, it's usually something like a lidocaine that your dentist would give you when you go to the, when you go to the dentist for, for a cavity. And then there's a steroid as, in there as well. And the lidocaine is something that's initially short acting that gives you relief right then and there. And the steroid can take up to a week to take effect um, as it helps to decrease the inflammation locally. And it can last for up to three to four months or even longer. Um, visco supplementation has so many, so many um, uh, explanations. It, it's been called a gel injection, the rooster shot. So um, uh, it's, it's got, a lot of, got a lot of terminology used for it, but the idea behind it is lubricating and cushioning gel that is injected inside the knee. 
And the reason why this may or may not work is because as we develop arthritis, the joint fluid that our body naturally produces has a higher water content. So it's getting more liquidy. And so by, by putting this visco supplementation in, it's, a, it's really viscous type fluid and um, can, can, in, can in general maybe help cushion the, the knee or the knee, and that's where it's indicated for. It may last up to four to six months. The AAOS, which is the governing body of orthopedic surgery um, in, the, in, their, in their treatment, puts out that there's really conflicting use on its, uh, uh, conflicting data on its use, and it's really not recommended for or against. And then, and then just really short, because, but this gets a lot of advertising because mainly because it makes a lot of people very much a lot of money is stem cells, PRP, platelet rich plasma, where you're injecting your own, your own blood that gets spin, spin down in the office back into the knee. Um, and concentrations vary, methods vary. There's really no clinical evidence support its use. It's usually not covered by insurance, extremely expensive for you, the patient. And again, people market the hell out of it, but there's really no literature for its support of use at this point in time. Okay, so now what happens when conservative therapy no longer works? What do we do? Well, this is when we do start talking about surgical options. And, and I didn't put any, any things here, but in general too, I look at the entire patient, we all look at the entire patient when we consider something for surgery. First and foremost, you have to have the indications for the, for, you, have, you have to have bad arthritis, which would be the indications for the surgery. But on top of that, you, we are looking at the overall health of the patient to see if they can safely undergo the surgery. So a lot of times we may ask you to see a heart doctor. We may ask you, we'll ask, ask you to see your primary doctor. If you have lung issues, we may ask you to see your pulmonologist. Uh, for me personally, I don't perform this surgery on smokers because uh, smoke, smoking has a higher risk of wound complications and infections. And infections is probably the worst complication that you can get in a joint replacement. And it's something that's typically pretty rare, less than 1%, but infection can highly increase the risk. Uh, diabetes, we look for good diabetic control. We look, we look for, um, uh, we look for a BMI, which is your, your height and your weight combined. We look for generally a BMI below 40 because people with BMI higher can have almost 10 times as higher risk of infection. So of course, this is assuming you are a candidate for all of those medical issues and you can undergo the surgery. And now we say you've got bone on bone arthritis, you failed, you failed all the conservative treatments. And most importantly, it's affecting your quality of life and just day to day, day in and day out, you're, you're miserable. This is, this is when it's time to consider surgery. It is, it is the most reliable way to relieve activity related joint pain due to arthritis. It is one of the most cost-effective and successful interventions in all of medicine. Uh, the 1994 the, uh, NIH consensus statement, basically total joint replacement is an option for nearly all patients with disease that causes chronic discomfort and significant functional impairment. This is really, this is really crazy too, this next statistic. So in 2017, there was over a million joint replacements that were being performed. And they suspect by 2030, there's going to be 4 million joint replacements. That is literally 10, nine, nine years away. Um, there's going to be a problem where there's going to be so many people who need them as the baby boomer population continues to age and people are younger and younger and more active. Um, there's not going to be enough surgeons to do all of these operations that are necessary. Hip and knee arthroplasty or replacement is one of the most common procedures performed. And you can see even in this 2000 Medicare data, $3.2 billion alone was spent on hip and knee replacements. At the time when this came out, the average age was 70, two thirds were female, one third were obese, and 90% were because of osteoarthritis. Of course, the rest of them were probably for rheumatoid or something similar. And then I just put this picture from the CDC to show, what, to show overall what obesity in America looked like from 1985 all the way to 2019, one of the most recent pictures I was able to find. And it's certainly a scary statistic. Um, and um, so proper patient selections is very important because in general, the majority of the country now has a BMI greater than 30. So um, this was a comment, this was a, goes along of the numbers that are increasing. This was JBJS is the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Uh, which is basically the New England Journal of Medicine for Orthopedics. Uh, and uh, this is the projection that says by, by 2030, uh, the numbers of total hips are going to go up almost 200%. Total knees are going to go up close to 700%. And you're going to see 
the total knee revision, 600, total knee revision, 600% by 2030. So again, um, this is good to know for me as somebody, I have job security, I'll be able to continue doing this as I, as I get older, but at the same exact time, there's gonna be so many people who need these surgeries and there's not gonna be enough people to do them. So let's talk a little bit about hip replacement. So what is a hip replacement? And it's okay if you don't know, I'm gonna do my best to explain it. Normally I, I'm in person, I have models and stuff, but I'll do my best that I can. So basically the hip is a ball and socket joint. So we basically take out the ball uh, down and, and then you see the stem and I got some more pictures coming up. So we basically take out the ball, we put a metal stem down the inside of the femur. That, is, is, uh, that has a roughened surface on it that the bone grows into. On the end of that ball goes a, goes a go, I'm, I'm sorry, at the end of that stem goes a ceramic or a metal ball. And then inside the cup or the acetabulum goes a metal cup that has the same type of roughened surface. The metal is made out of titanium generally. And that roughened surface also lets the bone grow in. Some people use screws to put it in and hold it in place. Some people don't. And then a piece of very wear resistant plastic snaps into that ball. And that's basically a hip replacement. The modern hip replacement as we know it today came around in the, in, in the early 1960s and, um, ha and, and has changed significantly, you could say, from the technology. But in general, it, it, it's, uh, the ideas um, are really quite the same. Back then, most everything was cemented. Um, all the stems were cemented in place. And now the technology has improved. And most things are uncemented, where we allow your own bone to grow into the stem, into the, into the cup. Um, to, but, it, it, but with all that new technology, 30-year data from the original hips that were done in 1960s still have never been matched to this date, interestingly enough. So this is this is interesting because you know again this is this is what what really from a medical perspective versus what people market and what's out there at, uh, in the community. So there's multiple types of hip replacements of what you can do. There's metal on poly. Poly is what I, what the plastic is termed. That's that's you know used to be one of the most common. There is ceramic on poly. That's the pink ball here. That's the one my wife says she's going to get if she ever needs a hip replacement. She wants the pink ball. Um, then there's ceramic on ceramic. This is the yellow. Um, and then there's metal on metal. Now, metal on metal uh, was one of was really big in favor in, in the early 2000s. And, and everybody's seen a commercial for problems with metal on metal hip replacements. Um, the short story of this is that they were releasing these tiny little metal ions and people were getting reactions to them. Not everybody, but some people did. So many of them have been recalled since they've come out. Um, and in general, they've fallen out of favor. We don't do them anymore. Ceramic on ceramic, the idea behind that was they actually have very low wear characteristics. But one of the things that can happen, and if you ever want to YouTube this, um, just Google ceramic on ceramic uh, squeak, and you can hear an audible squeak in people as they walk up the stairs. Now, I've never personally done ceramic on ceramic. I've revised some. But um, that would not be something that I'd want to, that I'd want to, that I'd want to have my patient have. And so basically you come down to the, the metal on plastic and the ceramic on plastic. And, and um, pretty much almost the gold standard nowadays is ceramic on plastic. That's what, I, that's what I do in every single patient. And that's what most people do in every single patient now. Every single year at the, at the joints meeting, um, they kind of pull the audience and they always publish the data. And ceramic on plastic was not as common. It used to be common for younger patients but now more so almost everybody's using them for every, for every patient. And again, here you can see an exploded diagram on the right of what a hip replacement looks like. The stem, the ball, the piece of plastic, and the cup. Okay, approaches to the hip. Now, there's been multiple approaches to the hip over the past 50 years. And this is one of the most common things that I, that I get, that I see in my office every single day that somebody's coming up. And again, this is, this is the beauty of marketing of what people do. There's the posterior, the lateral, or the anterior approach are the, the main things. And everybody is touting this anterior approach as this new and greatest things. Uh, and, and the anterior approach has been around for a very, very long time. It's not something new. Um, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's the way people are being trained. They all have their positives and negatives. Um, I personally perform the posterior approach. It's just how I was trained. But the most important thing is that they all have the same outcomes at six weeks. At six weeks, 
they all have the same exact outcome. And most of my patients are leaving the hospital the following day after a hip replacement anyway. Um, so I don't have any reason um, to try to learn an approach that I'm not comfortable with. Um, but that's the bottom line. Everything else that you hear is generally secondary just to marketing. This is just a picture showing the posterior approach. Obviously, it's usually much smaller than this, but this is an old style drawing. And then this is just, again, picture. I figured pictures are better than videos, though I have videos of this, because who knows with, the, with, the, with everybody in the audience. But basically, you, you dislocate the hip, you cut off the head. Here's the, the bottom right is showing the acetabulum, which is going to be reamed. Now, again, this is a really old style picture. So this is showing that they're placing cement into here. And then this is an example of what a cemented hip looks like. And as I kind of alluded to before, so which one is best? Which one is best? Because people come in, oh, I want the anterior approach. They said, well, it, it's not one size fits all. There may be something that's better for you than to somebody else. And it really comes down to surgeon comfort. As I said, the outcomes are literally no different. Um, and the most important thing is having a well done, well positioned total hip implant. Having the, having the implant position is the most important thing. And the bottom line is, and I tell this to my patients, choose the surgeon that you feel the most comfortable with and trust them to do what's best in their hands. Like, what, what can I get you through this best? Are you going to ask me to do something I, I, I'm not very comfortable with because this is what you read or this is what you did? So, so that's usually, this is my line. Choose, you know, if, if you liked me or, you know, and, and, and you thought, you think I'm going to take good care of you, then, you know, this is what I would recommend for you. Um, and, then here, and then just a little bit on total knee replacement. So um, a little bit different than hips because it's not a ball and socket joint. I describe uh, knee replacements like the cap on the end of a tooth, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the way to think about it. We're gonna take off just about a centimeter of bone all the way around so we can place this metal femur and metal tibia on top of, on top of each thing and then a piece of plastic that goes in between them. Um, and so, uh, like that's what I said, so cemented and uncemented, in general, cemented knee replacements are more common. Uh, they are still the gold standard in America. Uh, I've got a picture coming up of an uncemented implant. They are becoming more and more common as the technology gets better. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the cemented is in general the most common. And I said, in the total knee, the bearing surface, where with the other one, where in the total hips, we would say ceramic on plastic, this is metal, metal on plastic. Here's an example, uh, another picture. Again, we have these in our office that we show you, and then we're, we're just basically putting a cap on the end of the tooth of the femur here, a piece of plastic can snap in. And you can see in the center picture, the cement is acting almost like a grout that gets in besides the holes of the bone, and that's what attaches it. And then all the way on the bottom right, you can see this roughened surface on these areas, just like in the hip that we showed you earlier. And this implant is not get attached with any cement. And the hope is over time, it's stable enough that the bone can grow into it. With the idea that if biologically bone can grow into the implant, it may last a very long time and not loosen. Of course, there is no long-term data on that. So, but that's the idea behind it. And it's, be, and it's becoming more and more popular. And again, just more pictures. Here you go. This is what, it, this is what the cutting jigs would look like where the knee, and then you're putting the, the knee placement on it. Here's a picture in front of him. That's an x-ray of what a knee would look like. So just like in the hip, there's multiple approaches in the knee as well. Um, and just like in the hip, there, there's positives and negatives to all of them. And it really, just the same thing, comes down to the surgeon. Um, the most common is the medial parapetellar approach. Um, and it is the most extensive exposure. Uh, there's, again, no difference in recovery. Some of these minimally invasive or, or other techniques are out there. And the really downside of them is you're working through such a small hole, they have a high risk of placing the implants improperly. Um, and so, you know, again, risks and benefits to everything that we do. Just like I said, one side does not fit, uh, one side does not fit all and pretty much trust your surgeon, okay? Um, and, and of course, this is, this is beyond the scope. This is beyond the scope of this talk. But if you if you know if you if you read the news or any any commercial, everything's about robotics. Um, up at up at Hackensack, we have multiple different brands of robots that are utilized. And certainly, early data is potentially promising. Uh, what you should know about robots is there's there's many different brands out there. 
and um, they they help us place the implants in proper position in both use of the knee and the hip. But to date, they haven't been shown to, to have any better outcomes than without using it. Uh, certainly, if somebody doesn't do a lot of joint replacements and, and maybe having a robot to help them may be helpful. But in general, again, there's no long-term data. It's very, pro it's very promising and, it, and certainly it's very interesting to use the new, latest and greatest thing. But um, what, that's what, basically what I want you guys to know about that. So now we've talked about the surgery itself. What's a little bit about the recovery? Typically, um, you're up and out of bed walking the same day of surgery. Okay, uh, I'll, let, let, let's talk about, let, let me take a second and stop. So what used to be? So it used to be that you got a joint replacement, and this is not even that long ago, that you got a joint replacement. Maybe you stayed in the hospital for four or five days. Um, everybody went to rehab. Uh, that was just what you did. You went to rehab, and maybe you stayed in rehab for two to, week, two, two to four weeks, and then you went home after that. Everybody else, may, you, you may have been put on a, a morphine PCA for pain control. Probably everybody was put to sleep with general anesthesia at the time. Everything used to be about just you got this replacement and then you just had to stay still and not move. Um, that is not over the past 10 years. Um, that is not the place that joint that is not the way that joint replacements are done anymore. Uh, everything now is focused on quick and rapid recovery getting patients up and out, helping to control your pain, not so much with the use of narcotics, but with the use of other different medicines that work on all different pain pathways in your body uh, to help decrease the use of narcotics. Because the thing that's so horrible about narcotics is they make you tired, they have side effects, they make you nauseous, they make you constipated. And guess what? When, when you're all of those things, you're not going to want to participate in physical therapy. So it's going to be difficult for you to do all of that. And so that's where the paradigm has shifted towards this rapid recovery, which is really the gold standard for how we perform joint replacements across the country, and certainly a focus at, 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 at Hackensack and, and what we've been able to bring to Palisades since I've been there for the past year and a half as well. So with that being said, um, in general, you know, you have your surgery and the surgeries can take two hours, give or take. Um, and, you, and especially if you're done first thing in the morning, you know, by the afternoon, you're undergo, you're, you undergo spinal anesthesia. So you're technically awake during the surgery, but meaning you don't have a tube down your throat, but they give you medicine to go to sleep, similar to like a colonoscopy, which is usually people describe as the best sleep of their life and you don't remember anything. So you have the spinal anesthesia, which allows the surgeon to do what we have to do. And then the spinal wears off by the end of the case. And, and, and hopefully by the end of the case, you're, you're, already, you're, you're wide awake. The good thing about using a spinal anesthesia is it helps in post-operative uh, nausea. It helps in post-operative pain control. It allows the anesthesiologist to keep your blood pressure low and it, and it helps decrease our blood loss at the time of surgery. So everything about spinal, again, even when I was training and, I, and, I've, and I've only been through the training for the past 15 years is Everybody got general, and that's almost never done anymore. Stays, so one to, one to two nights in the hospital and then, and then discharge home. Like I said, no longer to rehab. Um, though every now and then there is somebody that needs to go to rehab. And don't think that if we do your joint replacement and you're not doing well, we're just going to kick you out and make you go home when you're not ready. That's not going to be the case. But in general, you're usually, usually in the hospital for less than 24 hours. You, you have the surgery. If you have the surgery on a Friday, you go home on a Saturday. Um, after discharge, usually therapy comes to your house for a couple of sessions, typically within Hackensack, it's usually like four sessions where they come to your house, and then you graduate to outpatient physical therapy. Um, return to work, of course, this varies depending on what you do. If you, at most everybody's working from home right now, so you can go back to work the next day. Um, but, uh, you know, a sedentary job is sitting at a desk, you know, we would typically say it might be six weeks. And active work, certainly if you're in construction, climbing up and down a ladder, it could be as much as three months. But uh, I usually tell my patients, you know, what, you know what, what it is that you do. And if you feel comfortable going back to work, then, you know, you're an adult. You can make a decision. Uh, you know, you can go back from my perspective whenever you feel like you want to go back. Uh, yeah, I guess this is it. So, I'm gonna, so I, I have a couple of cases here. 
uh, just to just to throw in. So this was a case from fellowship. So we've kind of I've showed you guys and gals all these these pictures. Um, if you're looking at the x ray, if you look at the left hand side of your screen, that's actually your right knee. When you look at an x ray, it's like looking in a mirror. So that's actually her right knee. So from all those pictures, you can see that she's got significant bone on bone arthritis on the inside of her knee. It's also very bent. Okay. Um, that's the, you know, it's very bow legged. Um, and that's, that's what can happen when arthritis gets really bad. On the, on the right side, which is really her left knee, you can see some of those metal screws in there. That's actually, that means that, you know, we can see that and know that she had a prior ACL reconstruction. The reason why you, the reason why you usually get your ACL reconstructed when you tear it, especially when you're younger, is that the ACL is very important for proper mechanics in the knee. And if the ACL is not functioning, you develop arthritis earlier than later. And so that's usually why we repair it, certainly in teenagers and 20 year olds. And uh, I, I don't remember when she had this, but it, there are metal implants there. So that means that it was done a long time ago because nowadays they use different types of things to repair the ACL. And this is interesting because this is, this is gonna be a video of her walking. Now I want you to look at her right knee when she walks. Her right knee is remember this one without the, without the metal in it over here. And her right knee goes out to the side. It's thrusting out to the side. And this is, this is a, a, an awesome example of just instability when somebody walks. Uh, let's play, here we go. So she steps on her knee, it just goes out to the side. It's thrusting out to the side. You can imagine how it just looks painful. <laughs> okay, there we go. So this is, this is an example of what we can, you know, what we can do. We have computer software that we can kind of template and figure out what size she's going to be even before we get in the operation. And you can see her leg used to be completely crooked, about 30 degrees. And then immediately, this is immediate post-op after the surgery, her leg is completely straight. So that's certainly the goal of the surgery. Um, this is a patient. I, this is a patient who I actually just did on Monday. I did get her permission to show her x-rays. Um, she is 42 years old. I know I spoke about osteoarthritis, but this is a woman. She's 42 years old. She has rheumatoid arthritis. Um, she's from Columbia, South America, and uh, was diagnosed with rheumatoid when she was very young. And, um, and, and uh, all of the now newer medicines that are around for rheumatoid arthritis have really been a game changer with to help decrease the risk of joint destruction. But she was diagnosed in a different country where we didn't have all of those meds. And um, you can see her, her, her picture. This is her walking in the office. One leg goes in one way, one leg goes out the other way. And, and you can imagine how difficult it is for her to walk. And of course, 42 years old, that is somebody that's quite young to perform a joint replacement on, but um, nonetheless, there's really no other options. Um, now I'm gonna show you again, just because we've seen all the other x-rays. So this is her right knee. This is the knee that went in. Um, and on, on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see just complete destruction where the bone just kind of collapsed. You can also see all this cloudy stuff all over the place. This is as her bone is broken down from her chronic steroid usage, it has kind of implanted itself within her, within her joint tissues. But basically, and these x-rays are not great because they're, the, they're taken in the recovery room. This was literally on Monday. Uh, but you can see her leg was bent out before, immediately after the surgery, it's straight. And the side view, you can see all this excess bone that we had to take out um, and with the total knee afterwards. This is her right side. Um, this is her left side. And again, you can see the before and after pictures. We do our best to take out all of the bone, but some of this bone is within the very, the, the very important structures within the knee that if we take out, the knee will just be unstable. So, um, so that's her left knee. And then this, this is the picture. This is, this is her picture taken in the office. You can see this is called, would be called a windswept view of the knee. Um, and this was a picture that I took right after the surgery. So you know, before we put the dressings on. Uh, so you can see just immediately after the surgery, we've been able to take her legs that were crooked and make them straight. And, um, and so far she's, so far she's now she, she will go to rehab.
because she had both of her knee replacements done at the same time. Uh, and so the recovery for that is a little bit, a little bit uh, um, trickier, so to speak. This, that's a good point. I, I, didn't, I didn't talk about this. So the question gets, the question gets asked about bilateral knee replacements. So um, I performed bilateral knee, re we obviously did bilateral knee replacements on her. And the reason why I would do it on her is if you can imagine, we could fix one leg, but then the other one is still not, the other one's still not great. And it's gonna be very hard to rehab the leg we just did if she still has another leg that she can't stand on. So the idea about doing both of them at the same time here is it's gonna be a longer, a longer, more difficult recovery. However, you've got two good knees that you can now stand on it and get better from. So that's the idea behind it. Um, let's talk about bilateral. So bilateral knees are commonly. I don't do them so commonly. My partner does them often. It's very important to have so to know the plus, the pluses and minuses. Certainly, the pluses of doing bilateral knees at the same time is yes, it's one surgery and you're done, and you don't have to have you don't have to have one knee replacement rehab. Three months later, have another knee replacement. So next thing you know, it's six months you've been out of work all this time. Um, but it's certainly a much harder rehab. You need to have good upper body strength and, and good lower body strength in order to be able to walk afterwards. There is a higher risk of complications. There's a higher risk of bleeding, need for blood transfusions. And so for me personally, in general, I don't like to perform bilateral knee replacements at the same time. I do like to perform one, get you through that. And then three months later, if not, maybe even slightly sooner, if you're hundred percent at that point in time, we'll go and we'll do the other one if you did need both of them. But certainly it's something that can be done at the same time. Uh, this is another example of a patient of mine, a uh, 59 year old. Uh, and again, this is not osteoarthritis, but this is just another example. I wanted to show this to you. This is, this is something called AVN or avascular necrosis, if you ever hear that term. And if you look at the femoral heads, as we saw, the previous femoral heads didn't look like this. If you, you imagine this femoral head is almost collapsed. I describe this like, like a, putting a dent in a ping pong ball. And what, ha and what happens is the bone that's directly underneath the cartilage starts dying. And as it dies, the bone collapses and then the cartilage above it collapses as well. And then you develop arthritis. And this person um, uh, developed this on both of his hips. Um, and this can be, uh, this AVN or avascular necrosis in general is common in, in, in two conditions. Uh, alcoholics, a lot of alcohol can use it or um, chronic high dose steroid use typically IV steroids. So people who may have been on rheumatoid arthritis, uh, HIV, um, and then there's a million other reasons that can cause it. And majority of the times we don't even know what causes it, but usually the two common things that we do know is going to be either, either chronic uh, significant alcohol use or chronic steroid use for, for some chronic disease. So this was a gentleman who we did, who I staged and did two hip replacements on. And so we got him through one and then we did the other. This actually, this guy, He's a very nice guy. He used to be a, a golden, he was a Golden Gloves champion uh, um, uh, in the past. And so now I want to kind of talk about some, some common worries or misconceptions. When I made this slide, when I was making this slide, I was like, what are the questions that patients kind of ask me all the time? And, and so this is why I put them on the slide because I can go over them. Uh, a lot of patients don't, are worried about undergoing surgery because they think it's going to be so painful. Well, I, I would never lie and say, you're not gonna have any pain whatsoever. But um, the idea of the surgery going to be so painful, as I described nowadays, we use this multimodal pain protocol. So, so we're giving you anti-inflammatory around the clock. We're giving you Tylenol around the clock. We're, we're injecting medicines inside your knee or your hip. Um, anesthesia can perform various blocks around the joints. And so in general, it's really not that painful, um, but you know, and we do the best to control your pain. So, and again, the way we used to do it 10 years ago is totally different than the way we do it now. Uh, this is a con, so the next one. I heard about a person who had a horrible experience or my sister, some, you know, it's always a story, oh, they had a horrible thing. Look, surgery is not without complications. Um, I, I already explained this, this is hip and joint replacement is like the most uh, successful operation that we do in medicine with great outcomes. But every, every surgery has complications. Uh, with hip and knee replacement, they're all extremely rare. They're less than 1%. So everything's all, so 
again, I always say that when I when this gets brought up, I say we don't know the specifics about that person's condition. You don't know what kind of arthritis they had. There could be something you don't know about. So yeah, you you do enough things. There will be people who do who do have bad experiences, but that's extremely extremely rare. The next, I have to go to rehab afterwards. I kind of hit on that already. Um, it, it's very interesting uh, at, at, at up at Hackensack, which is which is certainly a much higher volume than down at Palisades. Um, we really look at the metrics because there's only the, the, there's only two main people now myself myself and another surgeon who are pretty much doing doing hip and knee replacements down at Palisades, um, and we're both very busy down there. But up at Hackensack, there's probably 20 different orthopedic surgeons doing joint replacements. And before before COVID, um, we used to have about an about an 80 to 85 percent rate of people that were going home after. Um, after joint replacement. So, you know, 15 to 20% of patients were still going to rehab. Um, and since we've been open in May, um, that number has gone to uh, 95%, over 95% of patients are going home um, after joint replacement surgery. So patient, motivating, patient motivation factor is a big thing. There's a lot of what myself or another physician does in the office. It's really, the pre-misconceptions of, oh, I need to go to rehab for these things. And, and it's my job. And this is what I spend a lot of time talking to patients about in the office is that you don't have to go to rehab. You're going to be fine going home. You're probably going to go home the next day. Um, you're going to be up walking the same day of surgery. You know, I'm going to do my job and then we put you to work. Um, so um, that is certainly a misconception and, and is completely untrue. I'm not going to be able to walk afterwards. I, I, as I said, that's untrue. You're going, to, you're going to probably get up and walk the same day of the surgery. Can I play the same sports that I used to play before surgery? So um, with anything of orthopedic surgery, with anything of orthopedic surgery, like Peyton Manning got a spinal fusion in his neck, and then he went back to play professional football. I'm sure his spine surgeon wasn't thrilled about that, but he did it anyway. So, you know, we're putting metal and plastic in the body. Um, it, can, it, it, it can break. It has a finite lifespan. It won't last forever. And again, as I described that plastic, that's like the treads on the tire. So the more, the, if, you, if, if you run a marathon and you put more, if you put more mileage on that hip, it's going to wear out faster. But in general, um, play, doing things like playing golf, playing doubles tennis, people ask if I skied. Well, if you skied beforehand, I would say it's okay. If you've never skied before and you're 60 years old and you want to take it up after you had your hip replacement, now's probably not the time to do that. But um, in general, you can, still, you can still lead an active lifestyle. That's the whole reason why we do this. So you can lead an active lifestyle. Um, is a joint replacement right for me? So like I said before, I tell all my patients, arthritis is not a life-threatening condition. Uh, it really is, um, it's an elective procedure that we have to choose to do. Um, if, it, if, it's affecting your qual if it's affecting your quality of life, and your activities of daily living, and you can't do what you want to do. And certainly, you meet the indications where you have that bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, and you failed everything else. Then, it, then, then it's probably a very good option for you. And the majority of people, uh, they come back to tell me, I should have done this years ago. Um, but all these misconceptions and fears about undergoing surgery, and it's certainly surgery is a scary thing for people who don't undergo it. I understand that. But I basically, this is, you know, to leave, to, I'll, leave you, I'll leave you with this. Basically, what I tell every single one of my patients is, you meet the indications for surgery. You tell me when you're ready to have it done. And not a second before. I will do injections till the cows come home if you never want to have surgery. Uh, but you tell me when you're ready uh, to have it done. And that's when we can move forward with that. So, so that's it. Um, this is my office number. This is my email. This is my beautiful family who I, who I couldn't do this without. Um, as is my wife, Lori, and my, my older daughter, Hannah, and Juliet is the two-year-old in the picture. And um, I thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know I spoke a lot, and I will certainly answer any and all questions that anybody has. Now, we have some questions in the chat. Dr. Rossman, do you want me to read them out for you, or can you see Hold the on. chat? Let me, if I, let me see if I stop share. Uh, if I stop share, now I can read the chat. Okay. What is the average lifespan of a TKR? Thank you, Cindy Finkelman. Uh, 
the average lifespan of a total knee replacement? That's a good question. So in general, we would say that that 95% of knee replacements last 15 to 20 years. Um, so there is a finite lifespan. And, and I've had patients that I've revised who've had knee replacements 30 years ago. Um, but in general, you and, and the same thing for a hip, 95, 97% are going to last 15 to 20 years, if not longer. Um, so, you know, this is, this is, this goes into, it used to be, you didn't get a joint replacement until you were 70 or 80 years old. And, and now, you know, I just showed that picture of this 42 year old that we just did on Monday. There's nothing that we can do to, 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 we can't make her wait till she's 60. That's just inhumane. And so we just have to, we know we got to bite the bullet. We got to do the joint to give her quality of life back. We know we're going to have to do a revision later in life. Uh, but unfortunately we have to, that's something that we have to do. Uh, and is there an age restriction for total knee? So there, there really isn't. Um, the main thing that I look for, if I, I, I had a patient that I did a um, couple of months ago, he was 32, 32 years old. And so the older I get, now I'm starting to have patients that are younger than me doing joint replacements on, but he was 32 years old. He was in an accident where he suffered a multi-ligamentous um, injury to his knee and had multiple surgeries to reconstruct them. And then he ended up developing horrific arthritis on top of that. And he had been to five other surgeons. Nobody wanted to do his surgery because he's 32 years old and they were scared of doing it. And I said, you know, and I said, I'm not scared of doing his surgery. I wish I, w I wish it wasn't something that he needed, but I knew that we could get him through it. And I knew it was the right thing for him. And he's going to need a revision for sure. Um, so, you know, we indicated him for surgery. So um, if he did not have bone on bone arthritis, I would certainly be not opting him forever until he did. But when he, when it's that bad and, and you failed everything else, I think that, that I don't necessarily have an age restriction um, for either total hip or total knee. Um, do I recommend spinal surgery for arthritis in the back? Well, uh, that's a good question. I can, I'm, I'm not a spine specialist. That's a separate subspecialty within orthopedics. Um, I would certainly recommend seeing your pain management doctor, your PM&R doctor, your spine surgeon to talk to that. So I'm sorry, Monica. Um, I don't necessarily, I, I can't speak to that, but certainly see your specialist to see if that would be something for you. Um, to, okay. Uh, you mentioned two injections. Do both last up to three months? And does most insurances cover these injections? So that's a good question. So I mentioned two injections. So again, um, the, the two types of injections are pretty much the steroid injection and the gel injection. In general, most, and the gel injections can be quite expensive. So in general, the insurance company, we have to get approval for them, unless you're like straight Medicare, um, then there's some things that we can usually just give you. But um, in general, the insurance company wants to see that you've done, and some, I mean, sometimes I have to do these peer to peer where I have to talk to the insurance company and say the patient has done 12 weeks of physical therapy and has failed all this before they'll even approve it because the insurance companies try to do everything they can and not pay for stuff we need. But um, um, usually we start with a steroid injection. Uh, they want to see that we've at least failed that before we do the gel injection. Um, do both last up to three months? So uh, this is a question I get every day and, and I don't know how long they're gonna last for the individual patient. Sometimes you can get six months of relief out of it. Sometimes you're gonna get a day out of it. Um, in general, uh, I'll say a general thing is they, they tend to last less and less as the arthritis progresses and you undergo more and more injections. So you, the first injection may last three months. Maybe the second injection lasts three months, but maybe the third injection lasts two months. And then next thing you know, it's a week and a day. And um, what's the point of continuing to do this? We're just kicking the can down the road and it's not helping anything. Um, they generally do say that the gel injection can last longer. But again, I've got patients that gel injection does nothing for and, the, and then some that, that, that feel great. Um, and do most insurances cover these injections? So in general, almost anybody, I, I, I can't think of any reason that a patient comes to me in the office and that same day, I can give you a steroid injection if I see that that's necessary. Um, the gel injection, again, unless you're usually like a straight Medicare, usually it has to go through a prior authorization. And, and usually the insurance company, after you failed everything else, will cover that. 
Uh, in gen there's a million brands out there. And again, not one is better than the other. There's, there's some of them that are three shots, some of them that are single shots. And sometimes the insurance company says, well, you can give A, but you can't give B. And so that's what we have to give. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, side effects from the injection. So uh, that's a good question. So in general, there, there are very few side effects. So of course, uh, there can be pain at the site. Usually we use a very small needle, though anybody who's getting a needle thinks it's big and I, and I can respect that. Um, but usually uh, the side effects are quite minimal. Uh, you can get pain at the site. Um, you may get some swelling around the knee and some throbbing. There is an extremely, extremely rare uh, chance that you can get an infection um, from, from getting an injection, just like anything. Um, but uh, if you are a diabetic and you get a steroid injection, just like if you, if you, take, if you take like a Medrol dose pack or steroids by mouth, it can raise your blood sugar. Um, and that's something to watch out for. But again, in general, we're injecting the steroid directly into the knee. It's it's usually has less systemic side effects than when we than when you're taking something by mouth. Those were those were all the questions that I saw on there. Um, hopefully, I answered all of them for people. There's so much more to talk about with joint replacement, you know. Uh, but uh, given, given a limited amount of time, I, I did the best I could to try to cover all the bases of my day-to-day -day discussions that I have with patients every day. If, okay, here's another one. If you had the COVID vaccine, how long apart can you have the injection? Interesting. I don't think that there is any reason why you cannot have an injection if you've had the COVID vaccine. So I, I, I can't imagine, I, I haven't been told anything. And of course, things are constantly changing, but uh, getting the COVID vaccine has nothing to do with what, what, what someone would do for your hip or your knee. What is the best knee brace that you'd recommend? That's a good question. Um, there are, again, millions of types of knee braces out there. Some of it really depends on the type of arthritis that you have. If you have the most common type of arthritis is on the inside of your knee or the medial side, as we call it. And, and if it's really bad, there's something called an, a medial unloader brace. So it really, it really is time to, to see the surgeon and to see if you have a type of deformity but um, in general, usually something that's usually that neoprene thing that maybe has the metal slats on both sides, those are usually readily available in your drugstore and can be extremely helpful. Uh, but there are lots of different braces out there and there's not one that's better than the other. My pleasure, Martha. All right, if there's no other questions, um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Rossman. Thank you to Nikki and thank you to the whole um, Hackensack Meridian Health Palisades Medical Center for so generously putting on this presentation for us tonight. And thank you for everyone who attended. Yes, I would like to thank all of my family and friends who attended here as well. <laughs> Hopefully it was some good information. And uh, you know, if, you, if anybody wants to come and talk, Here's our, here's our office number. We have offices at Palisades and Hackensack, and we've got multiple subspecialties within all of orthopedics. So I'm sure we can find a place for, uh, for your aches and pains if you have anything. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Everybody have a good evening. Stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Rossman. <laughs>